Okay, so we've done some coding so far, and um, if it doesn't quite work for you, you might have noticed, oh, one little mistake. That was, that was supposed to be an equals, I put a slash. Or, whoops, I forgot to clo close my quote. Let's take a little digression uh, to talk a little bit about making your life easier, coding. One uh, simple thing is, uh, visually right now, our code, uh, our text is color-coded. Right? Like, blue is a tag, and red is an attribute. You might say, well, where can I look it up which, which color means what? Don't bother about that, because uh, I'm going to show you you can change your color scheme, so it doesn't matter that you memorize the colors. It helps, it will tell you what the different tags are, purple is a link, whatever. What I'm getting at is this coding scheme, this theme, is not the best for coding long term. This is basically bright white light pointing at my face for hours on end as I code. Especially if I'm in my office with the lights low, bright light in my face. You know, if you're, uh, as most of us, we're about to go to bed, we check our phones a little bit, the bright white light, that's annoying. We can change our color scheme. And this is completely optional, this is completely for aesthetics, but actually it does help your eyes. If you're not looking at bright light for hours on end, you will not be so fatigued. Let's take a moment to change the color scheme, and I'll show you a couple of ones that are a little bit better for long-term coding. Go up to the Settings menu and select Style Configurator. I don't think that's a real word, but Style Configurator. Let's click there. We have the default theme with all of the colors defined. Great. We have different themes. For example, Bespin. What that does is it changes it to a much nicer looking color scheme in that it's not bright white light pointing at your eyes. It's a little harder to see on my projector, but I've got other ones. Let's see, uh, deep black looks like that. Oh, that's really nice contrast. That yellow really stands out. I'm going to recommend any one of these other color schemes except the default because really bright light like that is bad for your eyes. And there's a couple of other ones that are not that good, like Navajo. No contrast. That's hard to read. I like... Um, these different ones, solarized. Well, that's that's a nice color scheme, but not enough contrast. So again, don't worry about memorizing red means an attribute, because when you're off in some of these other ones, the colors are different. Now, but I do have to say, if you're going to be serious about programming, you've got to choose Hello Kitty. <laughs> Any color you like. I'm going to keep it on the default because it, it looks best on my projector. But on your own station, you could choose different colors. Hot Fudge Sunday. It sounds better than it looks. Ruby Blue. That one's kind of cool. So at home, when I'm coding, I'm usually using Blackboard. These colors are nice contrasts. The colors are different, however. Under default, green means comment. Under here, gray is a comment. So these colors, you know, don't memorize them. They change by the theme. But I'm going to be under default for the whole course, just because it's easier for you to read on my projector. Once you find a color you like, you can save it. And if you then really have a lot of time and nothing better to do, you can go to each individual element and choose each individual color. But I think, you know, all of these ones that are built in, you'll probably find a good one. You know, obsidian is nice, although I think it needs more contrast. Plastic code wrap. Okay, so... One way that you're going to type your code properly is if you can look at it, like I showed a moment. Another way is maybe you have a really nice high-density high monitor like, like those, and it's a little hard to see. It's a little small. We can zoom in and out very easily. If you hold Control on the keyboard and use your scroll wheel, you can scroll in, zoom in, scroll out, zoom out. So if you hold control on the mouse and use the or hold control on the keyboard and then scroll wheel mouse. Now, I think some of your computers for some reason don't your scroll wheel doesn't work. So another way 
is control on the keyboard and then plus plus on the keyboard minus on the keyboard so if you needed to zoom in a little bit to code properly control plus control minus you can also see that up on the view menu zoom View zoom, control plus, control minus, reset zoom, control slash. Now those are on the number keypad on the right side, not on the number strip at the top. You can zoom in, you can zoom out. What I also do, you may notice, I as I'm writing this code, I often zoom in completely to the screen or zoom out. You can do that on your keyboard by holding the Windows key and then plus or minus. So Windows key and plus or minus. Those are a couple of tips there. Change your style to be more readable. Zoom in and zoom out is necessary. And one more thing that I'll mention, but I won't recommend yet. Right now we're writing our code manually. Honestly, we're doing it the hardest way. We are writing our code and it's got to be right or it doesn't work. We have auto-completion, but it's off on these computers because I want you to learn first. Then we can do the shortcuts of it, letting it complete the code for us. I'll show you where that's at if you want to look at it. And I'll remind you of it later, but we're going to do this the hard way, and later on you can use the shortcuts. If you go up to the Settings menu, Preferences, on the left side we have uh, Auto Complete, Auto Completion, and it's all off. If you turn on Enable Auto Completion on each input, I guess if you turn all of these on, uh, at the moment, I think it's cheating. But later on, once we get this experience, this is a great time saver. I don't want to have to type my code and remember to close the tag and the quote and all of that. Some of us are having that trouble a little bit to close our tags. This may help, but I would recommend do it the hard way first. And once you have that under your belt, you can do autocomplete. If you turn that on, it'll complete the tags for you. But I won't. I recommend you don't either yet. Okay, so we're seeing that uh, we added a an HTML tag of header and then a data role, a jQuery mobile data role of header. And what happened there is at the top of the screen, automatically, you get a section or a little piece at the top that gets stuck to the top. Well, we have also something like that for the footer. On many apps, at the very bottom, you have something constantly stuck at the bottom. So let's say after our link to go to page 2, add a new line, I'm on line 17, your line numbers don't have to match up, but if they do, we can refer to them. We want footer. The footer tab or tag. It's at the bottom of the screen. Footer. But it doesn't behave like a footer until we add a data role. Data role footer. So technically speaking, data dash is HTML5. Data dash role, data dash icon, data dash uh, transition, those are jQuery mobile specific attributes. So jQuery mobile has this documentation that says we're going to use data role, data icon, data transition. And behind the scenes, we're going to animate it. Behind the scenes, we're going to pl pl place the element at the bottom. 
behind the scenes, we'll write all of the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to do the hard work. You just need to know the right attributes and such. H4, copyright 2017. Usually we'll have an H1 in the header, and usually an H4 in the footer. And then we have h2 and 3 for the main body. Head of the screen using h1. End of the screen using h2 or h4. And we'll use h2 and 3 in between in the content, the main content. Save it and run it and see what happens. A little anticlimactic. What happens is, there's the copyright message, but I had thought it was going to be at the bottom of the screen, like an app. Now, for myself, what I like to do is, I have my, my web browser window. I don't have it maximized. You, you could, but I like to have it sort of, you know, smaller size, kind of like a mobile device, to kind of give me an idea, generally. Anyway, what I'm getting at is, I said that footer is at the is at the bottom of the screen. Right, we've got an app and we've got a footer area, but it didn't actually do it. It put it pretty high up. Well, technically, it's at the end of the content. I only have that amount of content so far, one button. So the footer is at the end of the content. And that doesn't look so nice. I want the footer stuck to the bottom of the screen, so we need another data attribute. Data roll footer to make it behave like a footer, to separate it visually, to center your text, etc. But then to stick it to the bottom, data dash position value fixed. Fix it to the bottom where we expect a footer. Now, no matter what content is in between header and footer, the footer should stay at the bottom. We'll run that. Data roll footer, data position fixed. The result that appears there should be that the footer is at the foot. Without that, it's too high. Now it's stuck to the bottom. Without having me, without me having to figure out heights and set right values and pay, play with uh, percentages and all of that, it knows to stick it at the end. Can be used only for footer or for header also can be fixed. Good point. We should use it also for the header. We don't see a problem at the moment, but we should also use header fixed for the header. So fixed is a is a comment? Not quite a comment, it's an attribute that is doing something. It's making it fixed. Can you fix something on the size as well? You could, but not with fixed. You have to do it a different way. So look at this. I put a bunch of buttons. If I scroll down, the header scrolled away. It, has, it does not have fixed. Footer has fixed. Data position fixed. It's stuck to the bottom. Header did not. And obviously, right now, you have one button, so you can't see this. But I put 20 buttons, and when I scroll, the header scrolls away. So we should include also data position fixed to the header. Let's 
it's not obvious now, but it's obvious when there's more content. So you can copy and paste or write it manually. Data position fixed. Fix the header to the head. Fix the footer to the foot. To the foot. You won't see a difference because you have nowhere to scroll really. But you saw when I had 20 buttons, it scrolled away. We have copyright 2017 just for something to put into the footer. We often have a copyright symbol uh, down there, so we can create the symbol by using the right HTML code, which is ampersand, that's the and symbol, shift 7, copy, semicolon. That will be converted into a copyright symbol. <coughs> We'll look up other possible symbols in a moment, but that creates a copyright symbol. And down on the foot, copyright symbol. We have UTF-8 activated at the very top. That basically then is saying, let us use a variety of characters, such as a copyright character. There's a bunch of them. We'll look them up in a moment, but off the top of my head, we have Euro symbol, yen symbol, we have uh, e acute, e acute, it's not acute e, although it does look cute. What this is, there's a little e with the accent mark. I want to write ole in Spanish. e acute. Notice the syntax, ampersand, some name that is defined, semicolon. That's the euro symbol, the end symbol. E with an acute accent mark. There's even some built-in icons. Hearts. Makes a little heart. Hearts and spades and faces and all that cool emoji that we're using nowadays. We type the right code and it will show up here. These are some that I know. Maybe you'd love to know even more of these special symbols. If there's, if only there was a way to look the, look them up. But did you get this icon? Or you type the code. Just write. Yeah, just write that code. Ampersand hearts semicolon, and it makes up. Euro symbol, and you write the euro command. These are known as HTML character entities. We can go online and search list of HTML character entities, and we'll get all 20,000 of them. <coughs> Probably 32,000 because of UTF-8. What are they called again? HTML character entities. So if you'd like to, you can take a quick uh, diversion and go to the web and search HTML character entities, and you'll, there'll be plenty more. Some of these have a very simple name, and some of them are a number. Some of them are a number because it's easier to type the number sometimes. So on the, on the web, HTML character entities. So if I wanted to do OE ligature, there it is, ampersand OELIG, capital R acute, 
know, all of these symbols. I got this one. Uh, I did a search HTML character entities, and I went over to this example here. Uh, I'll put that link in the in the in the code in case you want to look at it yourself. So again, my code. I'm going to put this into the network folder a little later, at the end of the day, and I'll make a note here. That's where I found a pretty good list of a bunch of these characters. If you need to use other symbols. Okay, so if we've got a header, we've got a footer, we need content, a content area in the middle. Section defines a page. Header is header, obviously. Footer is footer, obviously. We need now a tag for the main content. The button that, I, that we made a little while ago, that one, I want that to be part of the main content area. So before that button <coughs> and after that button, we'll add a new tag, article. And I'll indent the, the button so that it's fully inside visually of the article. This is another HTML5 tag. Originally they, they conceived these tags in around 2010 or so to uh, sort of define um, content on a website based on like a blog or a newspaper. So even though they were writing something futuristic, you know, website code, when the committee was inventing this, they were still thinking in terms of newspapers and print media. And print media has sections and headers and footers and articles. But we use them for, for the web and for apps. So an article is basically the main content area, sandwiched between the header and the footer. But of course it needs attributes to fully function. This one, though, the jQuery mobile team, for whatever reason, decided to make it weird, and it's not a data role. Older versions of jQuery mobile used a data role. We're using version 1.4.5 of jQuery mobile. If you use jQuery mobile 3 or 1.2 or whatever, it does use a data role of content, but forget I said that don't use the old version. We want to use the new version, which is a little weird, but you'll get used to it once you practice it. Role. Simply. Not data role. Role. And it also has an attribute of class. UI-content. So that's what you need to do for the main content area of a section or a screen an article with a role and a class. One class to set up a main content area of a page or section. Yeah, I kept on moving this in order to 
the the chat here. I yeah, I can switch it up for the rest of the all right, so um, what we have with this is the main content area. Okay, everyone, it's a, it's a little bit noisy. Private conversations, please, uh, let's lower it down a little bit, please. So uh, if you run this, now um, it's a little different. Let me go back to what it was before. Uh, I guess I closed it, but let me go back here. Okay, before that main content, what happens is that it uh, has no extra space. You see how the button goes all the way to the edge <coughs> without any breathing room with that data with that role of main and content. Now there's a little bit of space, a little breathing room. We've properly defined a header, a footer, a content area. So this is setting up our our whole screen section data role page, header, data role header, article, role main, class, UI content, and footer, data role footer. You may have noticed that if you go from page one to page two, it still looks plain, like half an hour ago. For the moment, the answer is yes. You would need to do this for every screen. You would need a section and a footer and everything. It does not get inherited automatically from to every subsequent page. So our section that we left alone a while ago is totally uh, lame. It's boring. totally boring without any of this jQuery mobile stuff. So screen two, there it is. Screen one obviously looks really good, but screen two, there's nothing there so far. One way uh, at the moment to kind of work with this is if you've got a, a sort of a complete section, you can copy and paste that multiple times and change the details. Because if every screen is going to have a header and a footer and a content, mm -hmm. instead of writing it yourself, why don't you copy and paste a section that does mm -hmm. exist? Let's practice that right now. We'll create a screen three. We'll, we'll fix screen two, sure, but let's create a screen three. So that is, let's copy everything from section to section of page one. It's got section, header, article, footer. It's complete. Let's copy that and paste it after page two. Now one little quirk that I've seen in Notepad, depending on how you make a selection and then when you paste, your indenting might be a little bit off. Uh, you should select from the beginning of the line to the end. When you copy this, when I paste, it will kind of indent in an odd way because it's missing the beginning part of it. No big deal, you can fix that. <coughs> you can fix that, but if I copy that first section and paste it after section 2, That's section one at the top, section two right here, page two. And I've got a new copy, which I need to rename in uh, unique identifier, remember? One thing is already called page one. Nothing else can have an ID of page one, or else the link would not know where to go. Two things are called page one. You click a link, it may go to the first one or the second one. <coughs> Who knows? So page three. Better yet, about. This is going to be my about section, my about screen. I would use real names for these things, not page one and two. You're going to lose track of what that means when you've got hundreds of lines of code. When you've got an ID that is meaningful like that, it should be easier for you to understand your own code. If I run this, there's no way to get to page three, the about page, at the moment. 
There's no button on section 1. There's no button in section 2. So it's there, it exists, but I can't get to it. I need a link, a button, to get to it. Before we, before we do that, let's also uh, refine our section 3 a little bit more. Um, right, it's a new section about, maybe not call that screen 1 anymore, let's call it About Us. In the main content area right here, I'm going to change that a little down on the footer, change it a little, just change the content a little bit of the About section to represent an about screen. For example, about us. Change the footer a little bit. the main content area. I'll remove that button and just put something else. It's just some, it's just some filler content. You can put whatever you want. The point is I'm... I started with a copy of a section simply to take its structure. I need header, I need article, I need all that stuff. Instead of typing it manually, I can take it from a starting point and just change it. Well, I want to make a way to be able to get to this section. From section 1, the home screen, let's do it a little smarter and make a nav bar. Make uh, a collection of buttons at the top that will let us jump from section to section easily. That button worked, but I want instead a, a real navigation element. So we'll go back to the first section and then we'll see how to create a nav bar. If I go back to the first section, in the header, I don't want to call it screen one anymore, we'll call it home. Home section, basically. Oftentimes what our heading one is might be what the ID is. Again, page one is fine for the moment, it's not a complex project. I would rather call this ID home. This is my home section. I would recommend also for yourself, and I'll do it in a bit, comments. I like to write a comment above a section and write a comment that says, you know, home section. With my color scheme of green, I can then be on the lookout for green comments, which I can then quickly read and orient myself when I've got 500 lines of code. I'm in the home section because I wrote a comment, home section. nav. We have a tag for nav bars. Navigation elements. By itself this doesn't do anything. It needs a data role. Nav bar. Some of these are obvious like header is header and footer is footer. And some of them are not. Section is page. Nav is nav bar. Article is the one that's tricky to remember. Role and class. A nav bar, technically, is often designed as a collection of links. Because of jQuery Mobile, that collection of simple links gets upgraded to look like a navbar, a horizontal element with clickable buttons. 
a collection of links, therefore will be an unordered list. Bullet points. UL is unordered list. So if we didn't have jQuery mobile installed, this would be bullet points, a little dot next to a link. But because we've got jQuery mobile, we've got these bullet points in an element called navbar, they will basically be upgraded to a nice looking navbar. li for list item, one bullet point, one list item, bullet point. Home. There's going to be a button to go home. There's going to be a button to go to about. A button to go wherever. So each one is a list item. An item in the list. Home contact about. It's not done yet, but it's it's getting there. Now there's a home, there's a contact, there's an about. They've all been put on the same line. There'll be an active link in a moment, but they're part of the header. They should be up on the top gray area. If they're down on the lower gray area, you put them in the wrong place. This nav bar, notice, is inside of the header. You should get used to, in Notepad, clicking on a tag to see its pair, to see the block. So that's one very easy way to troubleshoot. Did I type it properly? So for example, if I misspelled a word, I typed all the code properly, it's not working. Well, one, one, one way I debug is I click a tag to see its pair. There's the pair. There's the pair. I clicked on header. No pair highlighted. That's a way that's trying to tell me it doesn't see its pair. Or I misspelled header. So one wrong letter R broke everything. Put that back in there, and now it highlights it's connected. It sees the pair. So even that, just get used to clicking on a tag to see its pair. You will see the dotted line where it follows it. It highlights it depending on your color scheme, but it'll highlight it, and that's a way to, to see if you've typed the pairs. That's often a problem in HTML. You didn't type the pair right. You didn't type the tag right. Well, let's say I, you know, I thought I typed everything properly. Well, that's black instead of blue, whatever your color scheme is. Blue, black is not the right color for my code. Blue is. Black is the right color for regular content. Well, this class is supposed to be purple, but it's green. Green, in my case, is comments. So whatever your color scheme is, you use it to figure out what's wrong. It's not that red is wrong and blue is right. It's that it's just a color scheme. To further set up this navbar, well, a navbar usually is linked from page to page. So we have a list item, and then these need to be links. A link from home to home, a link from contact to contact, page 2, a link from about to page 3, the ID of page 3. So let's wrap an A tag. Each of these is going to need an A tag in a moment. And each of these is going to need an href. Home links to the home section. ID home. <coughs> pound symbol home. Do not forget the pound symbol. We have to have the pound symbol in href. That means ID. 
ID. You don't put the pound symbol in the ID, then you're saying ID equals ID. <coughs> that means ID, basically. Another A tag around this one. href contact. We have no contact page, actually. What do we do? Well, we'll borrow page two. We call that one page two. We could link that href pound page two, but avoid generic names for IDs because then it's hard to understand and maintain as you work. So uh, I'm going to call. I'm going to change my section of page two to contact. One thing I really like about Notepad is if you select a little piece of code, it will also highlight elsewhere that it's found. And that's another debugging trick. This is supposed to link to that. Well, I'm going to troubleshoot. I'm going to go back to the link. I'm going to select in my contact link. It's supposed to go to the contact ID. <coughs> Contact is supposed to link to contact. I thought I wrote contact. No, I didn't. I wrote contact. Misspelled. I highlighted contact there. It did not highlight there. If I highlight contact up there, when I type it right, it should then highlight there. All instances of the code that is selected highlight throughout the whole hundreds of lines of code. And the last one, href pound about. This is, uh, this is our nav bar. Nav, a data roll nav bar with an unordered <laughs> list of bullet points. Each individual bullet point is a link. All of that then works together because of the data roll. jQuery mobile then translates it into an equally spaced nav bar, a horizontal nav bar. We can make a vertical one too in another way, but here's an equally spaced nav bar. Each of the letters is centered in its little block. We can add more links up there by just adding more bullet points. They have also hover effects. It'd be nice if I if they had a little icon too. Is I wish there was a way to add an icon to a button. Data dash icon. And then you choose a button. So href data icon, We've got a home button, data icon, I think it's, it's either mail or email, I always forget, it's mail, and then about data dash icon, uh, we could use uh, info, there's an icon called info. Now I've got buttons and icons. It's a nav bar with rollovers and effects. We get a little house icon, an envelope, an info icon. If you click about, 
there's their about us screen. If you click contact, nothing really meaningful there, but it goes to another screen. I'm already on home, so if you click home, I stay on home. Now again, this is really cool. This is uh, if you were here on Tuesday, and if you, if you had never done HTML before, we accomplished a good amount on Tuesday. But then, if you hadn't done any HTML until coming to this class, look at how far you've gone today in two hours. Learning some of these tags, using jQuery Mobile as a framework. Look at this. That's looking like an interface, like a mobile website like an app. We still need to fill in a bunch of details, of course. This is not doing it for you. This is not cheating. This is a shortcut. I want to create these things. I want my own colors and my own pictures and design. That can be done. Yes, we'll do that. I want my own fonts. All that stuff. We will do that. But look at how far, how quickly we've come with jQuery Mobile, one of the many frameworks out there that will help you create a nice looking interface. What it does is still up to you, and we have a lot of, to talk about regarding JavaScript. That's the interactivity portion, isn't it? This is kind of handling the HTML and the CSS for us. The JavaScript, there's nothing really that's going to save you any effort. jQuery will in the amount of typing, but the logic of it and the what it needs to do, that's still stuff we'll struggle with. Is our code written properly? Is it doing it logically? The logout is just not working. The photo capture mechanism is not working. That's going to take us a lot of troubleshooting and so forth, but we'll get to that eventually. This is what we have so far. There's still more to do. Let's take one more break, and then we'll, uh, we'll go on. So if it didn't quite work, call me over. This is what we have so far.